Today I'm going to be um, talking about how plant physiological responses to CO2 uh, influence the transient climate response in CMIP6 Earth System models. Um, and this is work I've done in collaboration with um, Abby Swan, Marisa Lagu, um, Kyle Armour, and Jim Randerson. So answering this question of how plant responses to increasing CO2 can influence the transient climate response really requires um, bridging these two very different communities. So on the one hand, plants' responses to CO2 uh, are discussed a lot by plant physiologists, ecologists, and land modelers. So maybe more of a common topic in the biogeochemistry Science Friday community. Um, and on the other hand, the transient climate response or the TCR is a physical climate metric that assesses how much the climate will warm in response to a doubling of CO2. So this metric is more of a topic of debate um, in the climate dynamics community. And today I'm going to talk through how plant physiology does drive a small but significant amount of global warming in CMIP6 models, about 6%, um, but that plant responses to CO2 can explain a lot more of intermodel spread in uh, modeled CO2 forced warming. Um, and almost 50% locally in some land regions. So these topics of plant responses to CO2 um, and the transient climate response are connected because increasing CO2 alters global temperature through both the radiative effect of CO2 and through plants responses at the land surface. Just to get us on the same page on how plants can influence temperature, plants have um, two main relevant responses to increasing CO2. First, plants generally close their stomata. And secondly, plants can grow more leaves. And these plant responses influence land temperatures because they can influence evapotranspiration. So stomatal closure will decrease evapotranspiration while leaf area increases will increase evapotranspiration, all else being equal. So that means that the balance of these two factors will determine the net effect of um, plant responses on land evapotranspiration. And for the most part, we think that the stomatal closure term will dominate um, in many regions with at least moderate leaf area um, based on models and field experiments. So that would lead to a net decrease in land ET. And this is a decrease in evaporative cooling, um, which leads to warming. Plant responses uh, can also influence surface temperature by altering albedo through changes in leaf area and plant type distributions. Uh, I won't be focusing on that aspect as much today, but happy to answer any questions about um, physiologically driven changes in albedo. And this idea that plant responses can influence surface temperature on a global scale uh, isn't new at all. We've known about this since Sellers et al. 1996. Um, and when they first coupled a biosphere model to an atmosphere model, they found that physiological responses to CO2 increased global land temperature by about 0.3 degrees Celsius um, at two times CO2. And since then, there have been a lot of other modeling studies showing that plant responses to CO2 do tend to increase land temperatures, um, both when thinking on annual timescales and during heat waves. But despite all these studies and pretty broad recognition in carbon cycle science that these processes are important, um, plants' influence on global temperatures isn't as widely recognized by the climate dynamics community, and in particular, physiological responses influence on climate sensitivity metrics hadn't been systematically assessed um, across different CMIP models and CMIP phases, even though these plant responses are already embedded in these models that we're using to calculate climate sensitivity metrics, um, like the transient climate response. So, um, given this, I want to get us all on the same page about what the transient climate response is specifically. So the transient climate response, or the TCR, is a widely used metric that quantifies how much the global mean temperature increases in response to a doubling of CO2. It's calculated from model output like this, um, from the experiment where CO2 increases by 1% per year from pre-industrial levels. So we wanted to systematically parse apart um, how much plant responses to CO2 are contributing to this signal. So I'm going to talk through um, three related sub-questions that get at this uh, broader topic. 
first, how much do plants contribute to the TCR um, on average across all CMIP6 and CMIP5 models? Secondly, what mechanisms are driving plants' contribution to warming? And then finally, how much do plants contribute to uncertainty in CO2 force warming? To answer these questions, I'm using CMIP5 and CMIP6 model output from the C4MIP concentration-driven model experiments. So the full experiment is the standard experiment I talked through earlier where <clears throat> CO2 increases by 1% per year. And in the second experiment, which I'm referring to as RAD for radiation, only the atmosphere sees that increasing CO2 and the land and ocean continue to experience constant um, pre-industrial concentrations. So we can quantify the physiological effect by subtracting uh, radiation from the full. Um, so what do we find? This is that same air temperature time series from the full 1% CO2 experiment. And I analyzed all the models with C4MIP data available. So that was eight CMIP5 models in dotted lines, 12 CMIP6 models in solid lines. And if we subtract the radiation only experiment, we get the physiological contribution to warming. So the y-axis of this right panel is on a different scale, and we're going to zoom in on that figure that isolates the physiological effect. At two times CO2 across all the CMIP6 models um, in solid lines, physiology is contributing about 0.1 degrees Celsius, or about 6% of the total TCR. Um, so again, this is temperature averaged over all land and ocean, the global um, temperature change. So the physiological effect is a small but non-zero contributor to this full transient climate response uh, signal. But that is just the multi-model mean, um, and it's evident that the physiological contribution varies a lot across um, models. So this figure is showing the physiological contribution on both an absolute and a percentage basis. If we just look at the low end and the high end here, the CMIP5 um, GFDL model in light purple had basically no physiologically driven warming. While um, in the Met Office Hadley Center CMIP6 model, plant physiology accounted for about 10% um, of the global transient climate response. And in their CMIP5 model, plant physiology contributed about 20%, so a pretty big um, fraction of the signal in this model. Um, another takeaway from this time series is that model variability is also a big source of uncertainty in quantifying physiology's contribution to the transient climate response from these CMIP experiments. So in particular, some of the models um, we're analyzing here have these really large um, multi-decadal oscillations that exist in the pre-industrial control. Um, and in the time series here, you can kind of get a sense of that and visually see the physiological signal increasing with increasing CO2 concentration um, and emerging from the noise. Uh, but we, in addition to kind of visually seeing that happen, we dealt with this um, multi-decadal variability more quantitatively by comparing the physiological warming signal for each model to that model's um, distribution of 20-year running mean global temperature anomalies in the pre-industrial control. Um, and on a global scale, about half the models had significant um, physiologically driven warming at two times CO2, and more were significant at four times CO2. Um, but again, so far we've just been looking at global averages, um, but we know this is a land-driven process, um, and all but one of the CMIP6 models showed significant physiologically driven warming over land um, at four times CO2. This um, map of the physiologically driven warming at two times CO2 shows that the largest warming um, occurs over land, as you'd expect, um, with the most warming in high latitudes, followed by temperate and tropical forested regions, um, and there's some remotely driven ocean warming as well. And if we look at the physiological contribution to warming on a percentage rather than an absolute basis, we see that for the most part, um, these land regions still pop. So physiological effects are driving um, about 7% of the total 
um, CO2 forced land warming at two times CO2, but only about 4% uh, of warming over the ocean on average. Um, this green blob in the North Atlantic uh, is of course a pretty glaring exception to that. So this high uh, apparent percent contribution to warming is due to the fact that first there is some modest physiologically driven warming um, in the North Atlantic, um, but then secondly, there's very little radiatively driven warming in this region. So that small denominator makes the physiologically driven warming look like a really large percent contribution. So bringing this back to my first research question, I've shown that plant responses to CO2 do account for a small fraction of the transient climate response. Um, we think this is a real signal because there is good intermodal agreement in the sign of the physiological effect on temperature. There's also a consistent spatial pattern um, and physiologically driven warming is increasingly um, statistically significant at higher CO2 concentrations. So turning to my second question, um, what mechanisms drive plants contribution to warming? So plants can influence surface temperatures by um, changing partitioning between surface turbulent fluxes because plants um, influence evapotranspiration. And they can also increase temperatures by altering the net radiation that the land surface um, absorbs because physiological responses can change albedo, cloud cover, um, and column water vapor. So starting with plants control over evapotranspiration, we generally see that um, this is the CMIP-6 multi-model mean change in evapotranspiration due to physiological responses to CO2. Um, there's generally a decrease with the most uh, robust decrease in the tropics, um, which is consistent with what other studies have documented in CBIP-5 too. This figure is showing the zonal mean of the same information as that previous map. Um, so this is the net effect of all plant influences on evapotranspiration. Um, but if you remember earlier, I qualitatively talked through how this net effect um, results from two counteracting processes, increases in leaf area and changes in stomatal conductance. So we can quantitatively break this net change into its component parts to see um, what's leading to this net physiologically driven change. If we isolate the influence of stomatal conductance and BPD changes by looking at transpiration changes on a per leaf area basis, we can back out that um, stomatal conductance alone would have reduced land evapotranspiration um, a lot more than this net effect. And if we looked at the effect of LAI changes in isolation, we would have seen uh, large increases in transpiration across all latitudes. And then there's also a non-negligible interaction term between these two processes, which further decreases uh, evapotranspiration. So the net effect of these changes is a small but significant decrease in transpiration, uh, this black dotted line in the tropics. So the stomatal conductance term dominates and the full um, evapotranspiration change tracks that pretty closely um, because there's a pretty negligible change in ground evaporation uh, on average, though this varies a little by model. So I think uh, this partitioning shows that the physiologically driven change in evapotranspiration is really the sum of these two large terms of opposite signs. Um, so I think breaking apart those two large terms can be useful for probing the implications of uh, models being wrong about any of these um, physiological components. So for example, some observational studies would suggest that models systematically overestimate the leaf area increases that would result from CO2 fertilization. So if that were the case, we'd expect the net effect to be pulled closer to the stomatal conductance um, term. So bigger decreases in um, evapotranspiration due to plant responses to CO2. Um, in addition to changing the partitioning of surface turbulent fluxes, plant responses also drive changes in net radiation. Um, I don't have time to walk through all the changes in the surface energy budget, um, but I did want to briefly highlight how plants can increase the net radiation absorbed at the surface um, by increasing, or yeah, by decreasing um, cloud cover 
particularly low clouds. So there are these large um, cloud-driven increases in shortwave radiation in the northern hemisphere, um, mid and high latitudes, and over the northeastern Amazon. Um, it might be a little hard to see the, the stippling, but stippling is showing uh, poor model agreement. So there's pretty good um, model agreement in the sign of these uh, changes in the cloud shortwave radiative effect in these regions. Um, and this results from decreases in relative humidity um, due to physiologically forced reductions in both evapotranspiration and by the um, related increases in air temperatures. Um, so to circle back to the second question, um, plants drive land warming by suppressing, or plant responses to CO2 drive land warming by suppressing evapotranspiration, which increases um, the surface sensible heat flux, and also by increasing the net radiation absorbed um, at the surface uh, by changes in albedo, which it didn't show, and by decreases in cloud cover. All right, so that brings us to this uh, final part of this question. How much do plants contribute to um, intermodel spread in CO2 forced warming? Uh, I showed this figure um, earlier. I just wanted to bring it back for a second to remind you of the point that uh, the magnitude of physiologically driven warming varies a lot across models. So we wanted to see how much this intermodel spread in the physiological component of warming um, propagates to the intermodel spread in the full um, full CO2 forced warming. This map is comparing um, for each grid cell the intermodel standard deviation warming across the 12 CMIP6 models um, at two times CO2 in the radiation only experiment as a percentage of the standard deviation in the full experiment. So when this is near 100%, most of the intermodel spread in warming can be explained by radiative processes alone. But when this number is lower, not all of the intermodel spread in warming can be explained by radiation and physiology is contributing the difference. So when um, this number is 50, that, that means that radiation can explain about 50% of the intermodel spread and physiology explains the other 50%. So average globally, uh, most of these grid cells are close to 100. Radiation can explain most, but not all of the intermodel spread. Um, so the Physiology explains 8% um, of intermodel spread. If we look at warming um, just over non-glaciated land, radiation um, drives less, so about 86%, um, meaning that physiology explains about 14%. But if we take this one step further to look at this full spatial pattern, um, some regions pop out um, as a place where radiation alone really can't explain the full intermodel spread. So in particular, some of these highly forested land regions like tropical Africa, um, southeastern United States, among others, in these regions, almost 50% of intermodel disagreement in local warming at two times CO2 um, is driven by physiological responses to CO2. Um, and this was a surprise to me because when we were looking at the multi-model mean, there wasn't really anywhere where physiology was explaining 50% of the, the total warming signal, but it's more important for parsing apart um, differences between models. So these results suggest that physiological responses are a really significant contributor to intermodal spread in these uh, key land regions. Okay, so to circle back to answer this third question, uh, we can think about this as kind of three different scales. On a global level, plant responses increase the TCR a little by about 8%. On non-glaciated land, it's about 14%. Um, but on a local or regional level, um, there are some places where physiology is contributing as much as radiative processes to uncertainty in CO2 force warming. So recognizing this intermodal disagreement in um, how much physiological responses will lead to warming kind of begs the question, uh, which models are more or less realistic? Uh, and answering that's a challenge because there are very limited observations like face experiments in the tropics to directly answer that question. Um, so I think this intermodal spread really calls for 
kind of other creative observational constraints. Um, and a next step could be leveraging tools like ILAM to evaluate models performance and try to develop some um, constraints for what would be reasonable um, physiologically driven warming associated with different CO2 levels. While we need more uh, observational constraints, I also think there's a case to be made that um, the CMIP-6 ensemble may not even fully probe or representatively probe uh, the full scientific uncertainty surrounding plants' responses to CO2. So for example, a lot of models use the exact same value for the stomatal slope parameter for all C3 plants or a limited set um, for different PFTs, but there's um, documented really wide variation in this parameter across different plants. So this figure from Lin et al, um, 2015, um, shows a range in this parameter from a bunch of different measurements. Um, and I'm currently working on kind of further quantifying the biophysical implications of varying this parameter. Uh, and preliminary work is showing that uh, physiological warming in CESM is really sensitive to it. And more broadly, I think uh, parameter perturbation ensembles in CESM and E3SM will be really valuable for uh, further probing this parameter uncertainty beyond what we could even get from the CMIP-6 models. So um, we've shown here that while I think in climate science, we often consider these biological and ecological processes as fitting really neatly in this kind of carbon cycle feedbacks box, this carbon cycle uncertainty is extending uh, beyond the carbon cycle. So I think there's kind of a glass half full and glass half empty way of responding to this conclusion. So on the one hand, uh, if you happen to be a climate dynamicist, I think the fact that there's less intermodal spread in radiation only experiments means that models agree more on the magnitude of radiatively forced warming than you would think from just looking at the standard 1% CO2 experiment alone. So that's a good thing. Um, but on the other hand, um, acknowledging that carbon cycle uncertainty is embedded in climate sensitivity metrics like the TCR, means that if we want to reduce uncertainty in the kind of true full TCR, we have to deal with the carbon cycle on land, which is really complicated and really challenging to constrain. Um, so from that perspective, I think this analysis provides uh, yet another motivation, non-carbon cycle motivation for further observational constraints um, on these, how these key processes like stomatal conductance, leaf area, um, and transpiration should respond to increasing um, atmospheric CO2. Okay, so to wrap up, um, I've talked through how plant responses account for a small but significant fraction of the transient climate response. Um, plants influence warming um, by both altering the partitioning between surface turbulent fluxes and altering the net radiation at the land surface. Um, and that uncertainty in how plants will respond to CO2 increases intermodal spread um, in CO2 force warming, especially over land. Um, and I think these results matter because they mean that carbon cycle processes are embedded in global climate sensitivity metrics. Um, it also means that the physiological effects make CO2 different from other greenhouse gases, um, as like methane, for example, won't have this added warming um, from plant responses and kind of more broadly than the transient climate response metric in particular, um, this idea that like carbon cycle uncertainty has physical climate implications which extend beyond uh, just carbon cycle feedbacks. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. <laughs>